Welcome to the English version of our lecture on the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. I hope that this presentation will offer insight into the movement and at the end, even if you still don't understand everything about it or agree with everything that happens in the movement, I hope that you at least will understand that there is a reason for people's reactions. What is the Black Lives Matter movement? It is fundamentally a response to police violence and discrimination specifically against black people in the United States. Black people face a higher amount of discrimination and undue violence, as well as harshness at the hands of police in the United States. Black Lives Matter has become a banner for legal aid, social justice grassroots movements, protests of multiple types, media and educational content creation, writing, really any method that can be used to enact social change. I don't think I need to give such an introduction to the roots of racism against black people in the United States. The transatlantic slave trade is something that we are all familiar with. One effect of this tr slave trade is that to this day, one of the most inflammatory things that you can say to another person in the United States is that they or something they have said or done is racist. But one common misunderstanding that occurs here is the question of what type of racism is indicated. Spoiler alert, it is not all about whether or not you would call someone a the n-word. Racism has two aspects. First, it is the belief that people are different on the basis of their race. And second, it is the oppression and differences in experience faced by people on the basis of their race. As you will see, what an individual person believes about race in other words, whether or not a certain person is a racist, has very little to do with racial oppression in society. Intrapersonal racism is one person's beliefs about themselves in terms of race, how we view ourselves because of our race. And everybody experiences that, whether you are white or Asian or black or Roma or any other race. This is an internal form of racism. Interpersonal racism is beliefs about race that impact how people interact with each other, within and across differences. So how people within one race react to people of the same race, how they view and interact with people of other races. Institutional racism is policies and procedures that perpetuate oppression and discrimination within an organization or se sector. For example, the justice system. Structural racism is policies and norms that continue or perpetuate discrimination and oppression across sectors and across history. People may say, I'm not racist, I have black friends. People may say, but black people call each other these names and make jokes about black people. Why can't I, even though I'm white? All people are equal, aren't they? I have heard, yeah, I listen to Nas and other rappers with my car windows rolled down, and I hang out with my black sports teammates, so I'm basically black. The man who said this to me is named Milos, and he has Nordic runes tattooed by hand all over his body. He has a red beard, and when his head is not shaved, his hair is blonde. In other words, I am more black than Milos is. None of these people mean anything bad by what they're saying, of course not. Well, at least I assume not. But their individual status as not racist doesn't have much of an impact on the real struggles that Black people face. And for that, let's turn to the events of Black, the Black Lives Matter movement. I have here a list of the most important events. I need to clarify. Black people are killed in much higher proportion than white people at the hands of police. The stories I'm going to be telling you today are just particular myths that sparked particular outrage in the United States. This is not a complete list of everyone who has been killed at the hands of police, but these are the events that have caused the most protest. I'll start with Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Benjamin Martin was a 17-year-old African-American from Miami Gardens, Florida. He was fatally shot by George Zimmerman, 
a 28-year-old Hispanic American. Trayvon had accompanied his father to visit his father's fiance in a nearby Florida town. On the evening of February 26, Trayvon was walking back to his dad's fiance's house from a nearby convenience store. George Zimmerman, a member of the Community Watch, a local, um, a local protection organization, saw Martin, saw Trayvon, and reported him to the Sanford police as suspicious. Several minutes later, there was a fight, reportedly, and Zimmerman shot Trayvon in his chest. Zimmerman was injured during the altercation or the fight with Trayvon. He said he shot Trayvon in self-defense and was not charged. They didn't say that he was guilty at the time. The police said that there was no evidence to refute his claim of self-defense, and the law in Florida called the Stand Your Ground Law kept them from arresting Mr. Zimmerman or charging him with a crime. However, after national media focused on the incident, Zimmerman was eventually charged and tried, but the jury acquitted him of second degree murder and manslaughter in July. That means that the jury decided that he was not guilty of murder or of killing someone. Michael Brown was an 18 year old young man who was shot and killed by police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. This is a story that is personal for me because this event happened when I was living in St. Louis and the protests and riots that I'm about to describe happened right outside my apartment. Michael Brown was accompanied by his 22 year old friend Dorian, who later said that Michael had robbed a convenience store before the shooting occurred. Officer Wilson, a white male police officer said that there was a fight when Michael attacked him in his police vehicle to try to get Officer Wilson's service gun. The struggle continued until the pistol was fired. Dorian said that Officer Wilson started the fight by grabbing Michael Brown by the neck through, uh, through his patrol car window by threatening him and then shooting at him. At this point, both Officer Wilson and Dorian say that Dorian and Michael fled with Officer Wilson pursuing him shortly thereafter. Officer Wilson stated that Michael stopped and charged at him, ran at him after a short pursuit, a short chase. Johnson contradicted this account. Dorian said that didn't happen, saying that Michael turned around with his hands up after Officer Wilson shot at his back. According to Dorian, Officer Wilson shot Michael multiple times until he fell to the ground. In the entire fight, Officer Wilson fired a total of 12 bullets, including two during the struggle in the car. Michael was struck six times, all in the front of his body. Tamir Rice was a, just a boy. He was carrying a toy gun and Officer Lohman shot him almost immediately upon arriving at the scene. Two officers, Lohman and Garmbach, were responding to a police dispatch call regarding a male who had a gun. A caller reported that a male was pointing a pistol at random people in the Cuddle Recreation Center a park in the city of Cleveland's public works department. So people were playing in a park and someone called and said, a male has a gun. At the beginning of the call and again in the middle, the person who called said, the pistol is probably fake. Towards the end of the two minute call, the person calling says that the male is probably a young person but the dispatcher did not say that when he called the police officers Lowerman and Garmbach. The police officers reported that when they arrived at the scene, they both continuously yelled, show me your hands through the open patrol car window. Lowman further said that instead of showing his hands, it looked like Rice, Tamir Rice, was trying to draw his gun. 
the officer says, I knew it was a gun and I knew it was coming out. The officer shot twice, hitting Tamir once in the torso. According to the judge who heard the case, on the video, the zone car containing patrol officers Lohman and Garnbeck is still in the process of stopping when Rice is shot. Tamir Rice died the following day. Philando Castile. A St. Anthony police officer patrolling Larpenter Avenue radioed to a nearby squad that he planned to pull over the car and check the IDs of the driver and passenger, saying, the two occupants just look like people that were involved in a robbery. The driver looks more like one of our suspects, just because of the wide set nose. I couldn't get a good look at the passenger. The officer at 9 p.m. told a nearby officer that he would wait for him to make the stop. On July 6, 2016, Philando Castile, a 32-year-old African-American man, was fatally shot during a traffic stop by police officer Geronimo Yanez of the St. Anthony Police Department in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area. Philando was driving with his girlfriend, Diamond Reynolds, and her four-year-old daughter, when at 9 p.m. he was pulled over by Yanez and another officer in Falcon Heights, which is a suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota. After being asked for his license and registration, Philando told Officer Yanez that he had a firearm. Castile had a license to carry. That means that Philando had a legal permit to, harry, to carry a gun. And Yanez replied, don't reach for it then. Philando replied, I'm, I was reaching for, to which Yanez replied, don't pull it out. Philando replied, I'm not pulling it out. And Diamond said, he's not. Yanez interrupted again, saying, don't pull it out. Yanez then fired seven close-range shots at Castile, hitting him five times. Philando Castile died of his wounds at 9.37 p.m. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Reynolds posted a live stream video on Facebook from her in Castile's car. The incident quickly gained international interest. Local and national protests formed, and five months after the incident, Yanez was charged with second-degree manslaughter and two counts of dangerous discharge of a firearm. After five days of deliberation, the officer was acquitted of all charges in a jury trial on June 16, 2017. After the verdict, Officer Yanez was immediately fired by the city of St. Anthony. Anthony. Philando's family filed wrongful death lawsuits, and they were paid off in a total of $3.8 million. On July 17, 2014, Eric Garner was killed in the New York City borough of Staten Island after Daniel Pantaleo, a New York City Police Department officer, put him in a prohibited chokehold while arresting him. A chokehold is when you put your arm around someone's neck and pull the hand back so that you are choking them. Video footage of this incident generated widespread national attention and raised questions about the use of force by police enforcement, by law enforcement. NYPD officers approached Eric Garner on July 17th, suspecting that he was selling individual cigarettes from packs without tax stamps. After Eric told the police that he was tired of being harassed and that he was not selling cigarettes, the officers attempted to arrest him. When Pantaleo placed his hands on Garner, Eric pulled his arms away. Pantaleo then placed his arm around Eric's neck and wrestled him to the ground. With multiple officers pinning him on the ground, Eric repeated the words, I can't breathe, 11 times while lying face down on the sidewalk. After Eric lost consciousness, he remained lying on the sidewalk for seven minutes while the officers waited for an ambulance to arrive. Eric was pronounced dead at an area hospital approximately one hour later. Brianna Taylor. Brianna was a 26-year-old African-American woman. 
She was fatally shot in her Louisville, Kentucky apartment on March 13, 2020, when at least seven police officers forced their way into her apartment as part of an investigation into drug dealing operations. Three Louisville Metro Police Department officers were involved in this shooting. Brianna's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, was in the apartment. He was with her when the plainclothes officers knocked on the door and forced entry. Plainclothes officers means that they were not wearing police uniforms. They were dressed like regular people. Forced entry means that they knocked the door down to come in. The officers said that they announced themselves as police before they forced their way inside, but Walker, Kenneth, said he did not hear any announcement. He thought the officers were intruders and fired a warning shot at them. The shot hit one of the officers in the leg, and the rest of the officers who had forced their way into Brianna's house fired 32 bullets in return. Kenneth was unhurt, but Brianna, who was behind Kenneth, was hit by six bullets and died. During the incident, one of the officers moved to the side of the apartment and shot 10 bullets through a covered window and glass door. According to the police, Brianna's house was never searched. Kenneth Walker was charged with assault and attempted murder of a police officer, but the charges were dismissed or said that they didn't count anymore 12 months later. In June of that year, the Louisville Police Department fired Officer Hankinson for blindly firing through the covered patio door and window of Taylor's apartment. On September 15th, the city of Louisville agreed to pay Brianna's family $12 million and reform police practices. But she's still dead. In the 49ers' third preseason game in 2016, Kaepernick sat down during the playing of the U.S. National Anthem prior to the game. That means he did not stand or put his hand over his heart when our National Anthem was played. He did it as a protest against race, racial injustice, police brutality, and oppression in the country. The following week, and throughout the regular season, Kaepernick knelt during the anthem. That means he, put, he got down on one knee when the anthem was played. These protests of his received very polarized reactions. That means that the reactions were very dramatic in both extremes, strongly supporting him and strongly opposing him. Some people praised him and his stand against racism. Others denounced the protests. These actions overall resulted in wide, a wider protest movement, which was intensified in September 2017, at which point President Donald Trump said that NFL owners should fire players who protest during the national anthem. Ahmaud Arbery. On February 23, 2020, Ahmaud Arbery, a 25-year-old black man, was murdered during a racially motivated hate crime while jogging in Satya Shores, a neighborhood near Brunswick in Glynn County, Georgia. Neighborhood Watch members assumed that he was a burglar and three white men pursued him in their trucks for several minutes, using vehicles to block his path as he tried to run away. Two of the men, Travis McMichael and his father Gregory, were armed and in one vehicle. Their neighbor, William Bryan, was in another vehicle. After they caught up with Ahmad, Travis exited his truck and hit Arbery, hit Ahmad with a shotgun. As Arbery tried to defend himself, Travis shot him three times, murdering him. Brian recorded this confrontation and murder of Ahmad on his cell phone. Members of the police department arrived on the scene soon after the shooting, but no arrests were made for more than two months. George Floyd. George Perry Floyd Jr was an African-American man murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota during an arrest after a store clerk suspected Floyd may have used a fake $20 bill on May 25th, 2020. One of the four police officers who arrived on the scene knelt on Floyd's neck and back for nine minutes and 29 seconds. After his murder, 
Protests against police brutality, especially towards black people, quickly spread across the United States and around the world. His dying words, I can't breathe, became a rallying cry. Floyd grew up in Houston, Houston, Texas, playing football and basketball in high school and college. Between 1997 and 2005, he was convicted of eight different crimes, serving four years in prison for aggravated robbery. When he was paroled in 2013, he served as a mentor in his religious community. He posted many anti-violence videos to social media. In 2014, he moved to the Minneapolis area, living in St. Louis Park and working as a truck driver and a bouncer. In 2020, he lost his job as a truck driver and then his security job during COVID. The Kenosha Mass Shooting. On August 25th, 2020, Kyle Rittenhouse from Antioch, Illinois, a 17-year-old from Antioch, Illinois, fatally shot two men and wounded another one in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The shootings occurred during the protests, riots, and civil unrest that followed the shooting of another black man, Jacob Blake, by a white police officer. He was armed with an AR-15 style rifle and had joined a group of armed men in Kenosha who said they were in Kenosha to protect local businesses. Joseph Rosenbaum, a 36-year-old unarmed Kenosha man, chased Rittenhouse into a parking lot and grabbed the barrel of his rifle. Rittenhouse shot Rosenbaum four times at close range. Rittenhouse fled and was pursued by a crowd. Anthony Huber was fatally shot once in the chest by Rittenhouse after he struck him with a skateboard and grabbed at his gun. Gage Grosskreutz was a 26-year-old man armed with a handgun who was shot by Rittenhouse once in the right arm. He survived. Kenosha County prosecutors charged Rittenhouse with two counts of homicide, one count of attempted homicide, two counts of reckless endangerment, one count of unlawful possession of a firearm, and one count of curfew violation. His trial lasted from November 1st through 19th. Prosecutors sought to show, sought to show him as a criminal gunman, while defense lawyers said that it was in self-defense. He was complain complaining that the attackers were part of a mob that attacked him in the street like an animal and that he used the force ne necessary to prevent death or harm to himself. Judge Bruce Schroeder dismissed the unlawful possession charge because he was allowed to have a gun, apparently, even though he was underage and someone had given him the gun. He hadn't bought it himself. And a jury found Rittenhouse not guilty of the remaining charges. The Portland, Oregon protests. Shortly after George Floyd's murder, there was an almost nonstop series of protests, violent and peaceful, but overall, a large amount of the violence from law enforcement and from protesters. The, in many cases, the violence from the law enforcement officers was greater than that of the protesters. In July, Donald Trump, a president at the time, authorized the Department of Homeland Security, which is the National Guard and the Army, to send troops there, as if it was a war zone. The protests in Lafayette Square. On June 1st, 2020, amidst the George Floyd protests in Washington, DC, law enforcement officers used tear gas and other riot control tactics to forcefully clear peaceful protesters from Lafayette Square surrounding streets. Was it because they were misbehaving? No. President Donald Trump and other senior administration officials wanted to walk from the White House to the St. John's Episcopal Church. There, Trump held up a Bible and posed for a photo in front of the Ashburton House, which is the church's parish house. It had been damaged by a fire during protests the night before. So peaceful protesters were treated like violent criminals and cleared by force. Now, you've heard about the protests and you've heard about the movement. I'd like to address some of the most common criticism against Black Lives Matter. Here you see a list of them. Why do people loot and riot for these protests? Why don't they just protest peacefully? If people just focused on being good, 
then these things wouldn't happen to them. The police officers are just doing their jobs. If someone is a criminal, they need to face the law. It doesn't matter what race the person is. Why do these people run or fight back when police confront them? Doesn't that make them look guilty? These people ought to trust the legal system, that it will take care of things. Blue lives matter. All lives matter. Why are we saying that Black lives matter? Why don't we have these other movements for other races? Let's take these con common criticisms one by one. Why the looting and rioting? Why don't people just protest uh, in peace? The short version of the answer is that they have, and they do, and they have been doing this, and that has not yet resolved the problem. I have here many statistics and graphs that show how black people are still greater, they sp still face a greater risk of violence at the hands of police officers. I'll show you later another slide showing how much peaceful protesting has happened and how even though decades and decades have gone by since the civil rights movement, there still is not a resolution. I'm not saying that looting and rioting is okay, but if for decades peaceful protests have not done anything, it's reasonable to understand that humans might be feeling a bit desperate. Imagine the Czech Republic had the Velvet Revolution not occurred. Without student protests and without the Velvet Revolution, would communism have ended when it did? If people just focus on being good people, these things wouldn't happen to them. Remember the stories that I told you. Tamir Rice was playing with a toy gun. Trayvon Martin was walking home with a bag of Skittles in his pocket. Philando Castile was driving home with all of his legal documents in order. This isn't a question of whether or not people are being good people. Additionally, Brianna Taylor was asleep in her bed. Her boyfriend, had a permit to have a gun, and people dressed like anybody else suddenly start to break into his house. He had a right under the Second Amendment to, def to have a weapon and defend himself. These people were all following the law. They were not doing anything wrong, yet they still died at the hands of police officers. Police officers are just doing their job. If someone is a criminal, they need to face the law. It doesn't matter what their race is. Yes, people who, f who break the law deserve to face the law. However, there is much data that goes to support the claim that black people face greater punishments, harsher punishments for the same crime as white people. Why do people run or fight when police confront them? Doesn't that make them look guilty? Imagine that you have grown up in a community where you hear that the police are not there to protect you, they're there to be violent, and you hear all the time growing up about people who have died from police officers. Then you're going along, minding your own business, and suddenly a police officer comes at you aggressively, all of a sudden pulls his gun out and tells you to stop. The human reaction is to be scared of that, possibly to run away. And imagine what your reaction would be if a police officer knelt on your back, wrapped his arm around your neck, if you started to feel like you were suffocating or that you were being attacked. I think any of us, because of our nature as humans that we have from millennia of evolution, would have us fight back to defend our lives. I don't think it's reasonable to expect that someone who is feeling like they are being attacked, that their life is in danger, should just lay down and try to appear as a peaceful person. They ought to trust the legal system, that it will take care of things. This schematic that you, sh that you see here describes the entire process from when a crime happens to uh, the end of the trial and the, and the outcome of the verdict. I don't have another 20 minutes to explain everything that's written in this legal system, but this is, this is the way the legal system ought to work in an ideal scenario. Additionally, 
even if so even if it works well it's still a complicated process furthermore as i've mentioned several times now there is much data to support the fact that the the legal system and the justice system do not work well for uh for people from all races many times people from other races face harsher punishments for the same crime the question of blue lives matter all lives matter many people get very upset at the thought that we are it, we seem to be against police officers the blue lives matter by the way is a reference to police officers many police officers have lost their lives in the line of duty meaning while they were doing their jobs all lives matter of course all lives matter imagine you're at home in your family your bro- your younger brother comes home and says Man, I had a hard day today. I fell on the playground and I think I broke my arm. What would you say to your little brother? Would you say, "Why are why are you upset about your broken arm? Like, do you think that my my blister that I got from gym class is not as important?" No. If he if someone is hurting, you show compassion to the person that is hurting. And his broken arm doesn't mean that your blister is not important. they are just two separate things you can't compare them the illogical argument to say that just because we say that black lives matter we don't believe that all lives matter or that we don't believe that police lives matter they are separate things why do they loot and riot why do don't they try to settle things peacefully here you see just how many official uh official and academic articles have been published about the topics of racial uh racial integration and the inequalities and in how different races uh experience the justice system. These are just academic articles. This is not to mention all of the novels, all of the dissertations, all of the books, all of the media content that shows how people have tried to bring awareness about this issue and bring resolution about this issue in a peaceful way. And again, if decades of peaceful reasonable discourse and peaceful reasonable ways to address problems have not worked i'm not saying again that looting or rioting is correct i'm saying that it's understandable to think if being peaceful didn't work what else can, what else can we do in closing i would like to show a little bit of how i believe as an american living in the czech republic americans and czechs face problems differently and to be honest uh this is just my this is just my perception of it but it may be able to shed some light on how americans deal with problems differently than czech people americans believe that the first step to solving a problem is to acknowledge it this is why activities that raise awareness or protests just to wa- raise awareness about an issue are seen as very meaningful. On the other hand, Czech people tend to believe that the first step to resolving a problem is to accept that everything sucks and to kind of we would you would say in Czech smiejit se s tim, or nebo srovnat se s tim. So basically working it out in your own heart to say that things are always going to suck and even if we raise awareness to issues we probably can't make it stop sucking. Americans believe that something worth doing is worth doing in a big way. A common saying that we have is go big or go home, which is why something that may seem to be overly dramatic to a Czech person is something that is just doing is just being done right by Americans. On the other hand, Czech people tend to believe that a thing worth worth doing is worth doing nejšikovněji. in with maximum outcome and minimal effort. Americans are, I think, toxically independent. So offering solidarity and the chance to stand united with others is very significant to us. This is why protests in a big number of people is so meaningful for us because if you feel like you are completely alone facing something, then all of a sudden to see that you're surrounded by other people that gives you courage to face in inequalities and face the bad things that are in this world on the other hand checks have a more collective view of society 
So they don't tend to protest for solidarity. It's not that solidarity is something that they are so much looking for. There is real, they tend to, in my opinion, only resort to protesting when there truly is no other more peaceful way to do something. We also say in America that the squeaky wheel gets the grease and whoever yells the loudest will get listened to first. So we're loud. On the other hand, I believe that Czech people would say that you can complain and whine all you want, probably nothing will change. I don't really think that one of these approaches is more right than the other. I don't think that either of these approaches is more wrong than the other. They're simply two cultures that exist side by side. And obviously the beliefs that one culture has will affect how they see the other one. I'd like to leave you after this very cheerful and fun topic with a few words of what I hope is encouragement. Remember, as you look at things that you don't understand or that people see as different, remember that people have different coping mechanisms for dealing with stress and trauma, and they have different ways of resolving conflict. Regardless of what situation you're in, you should always listen to people who are different from you. If you're really brave, you can seek out the opinions of people who are different from you. You never know. You might just learn something from them. It's always good to spend your life trying to look at things from other points of view. You don't need to embrace what other people think, and you don't need to change your opinion. That's your thing. But it's fair to point out that if enough people say that something is important, it's probably worth it to at least investigate what they say and be curious about it. Thank you very much for your attention, and Black Lives Matter. Keep reading, my friends. Nerds conquer the world.